it's great to be with you this evening. If you take your Bible and turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. The next couple of weeks we will be in Daniel. Uh, Daniel 1 and Daniel, Daniel 6. But under consideration this evening, Daniel uh, chapter 1. And we shall read the whole chapter through. Let us hear then the word of God. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he, that is Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning and competence, to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans or of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favour and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king? Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you, and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this, the reading of his word. Just a short prayer. Father, what we, we have not, we pray that you would give us. What we know not, we pray that you would teach us. And what we are not, we pray that you would make us. For Jesus' sake. Amen. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the, the poplar trees, we, we hung our harps. For there our, our captors asked for us songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Well, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? How can we sing the Lord's song while in a foreign land? 
As we come to the book of Daniel, we will, we will see that amongst other things, this is one of the questions that the exiled people of God were asking. Can I faithfully live for the Lord in a foreign land? And that too is a very contemporary question for us two friends, for us who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says that we too are an exiled people. We are citizens of heaven. And from there we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we too ask questions like, how will I make it? How can I live faithfully for the Lord in the situations that I find myself in? Situations at home, in my neighbourhood, in my school, in my university, in my place of work, amongst my family and my friends. Is it possible for me to sing the Lord's song in these environments? These environments that are hostile to him and hostile to everything that I believe? Well, as we come to the book of Daniel, we will see that the answer to those questions both then and now are a resounding yes. Yes, it is possible to sing the Lord's song. And yes, it is possible not only to live faithfully, but also to live fruitfully for the Lord while in a foreign land. Over these two, next two Sunday evenings, we will, God willing, aim to study um, Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 6 together. These chapters record the, the spiritual testimony of Daniel from the beginning of the exile to the end of the exile, covering Daniel's life from a teenager aged maybe about 14 until he was a much older man in his 80s. So these chapters will have much to say by, by way of encouragement that we can never be too young, nor can we be too old to live faithfully for the Lord in a foreign land. And these chapters will also come by way of challenge. Challenge to the younger generation that faithful, fruitful living is not just for the older folks. And also challenge too to the older generation that you must continue to live faithfully and fruitfully, even though you may have done so for years. You can't take your foot off the gas and leave it to the younger generation. No, you must continue to the end for your good and for the good of all those who come behind you. You must finish the race and finish it well. Well, let's get into the text of, of Daniel chapter 1. There are many things in this chapter that will enable faithful living in a foreign land. But the first thing I want us to see from this chapter, you will find in verses 1 and 2. Remember who is king. Remember who is king. These verses set the scene that really are the key to understanding the big theme of the book, that the Lord is king, the Lord reigns. Verse 1 thrusts us into the year 605 B.C., to the beginning of the exile of the people of God. The exodus. The exodus had been the, the blockbuster event of the Old Testament for God's people. Having been led out of Egypt and slavery by Moses under the hand of God to the promised land. But what we have here in these verses is the catastrophic event of the exile. God's people defeated, dispersed and carried off into a foreign land well who or what was behind the exile well if we look to verse 1 and to the history books of the world verse 1 tells us it was the military might and the power of the Babylonian empire but if we look to verse 2 God's word tells us that it was the Lord it was the Lord who delivered Jehoiakim into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar that over even the earth shattering events of the exile the Lord was sovereign and in total control. And friends, we see God's sovereign hand all over this chapter. Verse 2, giving Jehoiakim into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. Verse 9, the official showing uh, Daniel favor. Verse 17, God giving learning and skill and wisdom to Daniel and his friends. You see, friends, Daniel had learned that he must view all of life's events, not just through the verse 1s of life, but also through the verse 2s, that all of life's events, all of life's events are under the loving hand of a sovereign God. Well, you may ask, if God is both loving and sovereign, why did he allow the exile to happen to his people? 
Well, if you read the books of Chronicles and Kings, you would read of the, the, the downward spiritual spiral of the people of God. The downward spiritual spiral into sin and apostasy. Turning away from the God who loved them. So the, God, so the exile was an act of judgment from God. But ultimately, the exile was an act of mercy. Mercy in order that God would heal them by drawing them back to himself. And friends, Daniel knew that if God had ultimately been the cause of the exile, then he knew that God could keep him during the exile, protect him during the exile, and use him for the glory of God all throughout the exile. And it's the same for us, friends. Whatever the situation or the circumstance in your life, they are all in the Lord's sovereign hand. And you can live for him amidst these things. The second thing we learn from verses 1 and 2 is that there is a war going on. A war between Babylon and Jerusalem. A war between the literal places that are Babylon and Jerusalem. But also that these literal places are symbolic. Babylon is symbolic for the city of man. The city of man that is opposed to God and to his ways and his purposes. Jerusalem is symbolic for the city of God where people dwell under God's word and under God's rule. And there is a war going on between these two cities. And it has been that way from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 11, the building of the Tower of Babel, built in the land of Shinar, as in verse 2 of Daniel chapter 1, built in opposition to God, built that the builders would build an, a city and a name for themselves, for their own glory and not for the glory of God, built so that they would not be dispersed over the face of the earth, totally against the purposes of God who had commanded them to multiply and subdue the whole earth. Friends, this is in total contrast to what we read in the next chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, and the story of Abram. Abram, who was called out from Ur of the Chaldeans to follow the Lord. And Hebrews chapter 11 gives comment on this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Abram was looking for the city that was built by God, not by man like those in Genesis chapter 11. It's the tale of two cities. One that is opposed to God and rages war against him. And another that is at peace with God and is hated by the world. And as we will see in this chapter, this battle is for the hearts and the minds of men. And friends, we need to understand this. We need to understand that we will be involved in a battle right to the very end. God will build his city, as Daniel was told in Daniel chapter 9, and as the apostle John writes in Revelation 22. The victory is secured, but until the very end, the battle will rage. Just as the apostle John writes in Revelation 12, all those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, the dragon will make war on. It's exactly what the Apostle Paul reminds us of in, in Ephesians chapter 6. We are in a spiritual war and we need to clothe ourselves with the full armor of God, just like Daniel and his friends. And we also need to remember that the Lord is king. And Daniel and his friends, well, they certainly needed to remember that as they were off to university, verse 3 to 7, off to university. We are told here in these verses that Nebuchadnezzar had taken the cream of the crop from among Israel's youth, verse 3 and 4. And he planned to send them to university for three years. For three years to be engaged in a training program to teach them the, the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And after this time, they were to stand before the king to be enrolled in his service. Well, what a prestigious opportunity. 
This was much bigger than giving a scholarship to someone from a poor background. Nebuchadnezzar had given this opportunity to exiles. Some of the captive Jews. Some of the captive Jews were to enter into his training program. What an opportunity. It would have came with great fame and great acclaim. And also great rewards, food and drink. And this was not just any food and drink. This is Marks and Spencer's. No, it was much better than that. It was food and drink from the table of the king himself. What an opportunity. And that's how certainly some of the parents of these children would have viewed this, op viewed this opportunity. You can just picture the scene, can't you? Parents discussing the matter and saying, Oh, well. Captivity in Babylon is not quite so bad after all. Nebuchadnezzar is going to do something with our boys. I mean, the University of Babylon, it wouldn't have been in my top ten. But after all, a degree is a degree. And they would have encouraged the young folks on to make the most of their opportunity. But friends, this was no ordinary three-year stint at university. There would be no UCCF workers calling, calling and encouraging you on in the faith. No, this was a three-year program of indoctrination. Nebuchadnezzar had taken them out of Jerusalem and he was now going to put Babylon into them. Let me just read a little from this book by the rivers of Babylon. It's from Mr. James Philip. And here's what Mr. James Philip writes. Let us look first of all at Nebuchadnezzar's plan and purpose in choosing the young Hebrews. Was this merely a whim, a caprice on his part? Was he simply playing himself, whiling away the idle hours, with all his conquests for the moment at least completed? One can hardly think so. And when one realises something of the trouble he was prepared to take with them, one begins to see that this was no passing fancy, but something with a very decided purpose. Look at what he is doing. He is laying his hands upon the youth, the coming generation of Israelites. He is not concerned with the older generation of captives, no, for they will die off quite soon and will be no more a thorn in Babylon's side. It is the coming generation that will be a problem for Nebuchadnezzar in the future and he is going to take very good care that that will not happen for he is going to make them into Babylonians. He is going to make them into Chaldeans. Friends, it was, a, it was a sinister plan. A sinister plan that was, that was ever so subtle. Orchestrated to take their identities without them even knowing it was happening. A battle for their minds, which was really a battle for their hearts. If you change how people think, then you will change how people act. And friends, the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar is alive and well today. The Chaldean language and literature has had its way, even with us. Society has changed so much in the past 50 years or so. We're so used to it, we don't even notice. The sin that used to slink down the back alley now struts down the main street. And no one even bats an eyelid. There is a war, an assault on morality and on the laws of God and his people. And this is focused especially on the young, who are well taught the language and the literature of the Chaldeans, well taught them in our schools. Their abortion, homosexuality are all taught as normal. I read a report recently from the Christian Institute that told us that schools in England were teaching five to seven year olds about prostitution and how to identify a sexually transmitted disease. Just a couple of months ago, a, a friend of mine was at a primary school, um, a minister friend of mine here in Glasgow was at a primary school assembly, um, and the head ma ma headmaster stood up, and he said, some families have a mummy and a daddy. Some families just have a, a daddy. Some families just have a mummy. Some families have two mummies and some families have two daddies. And then he held up a poster which read, different family, same love. The language and the literature of the Chaldeans is everywhere in society, in film, in magazine, 
theatre, medicine, education, politics, internet, the whole music scene. And it all consists of a, a subtle assault on our minds to accept sin as normal. And sadly, friends, the language and the literature of the Chaldeans has infected some areas of the church. Some areas of the church have taken on some of the world's teaching, losing all their distinctiveness. And as far as the gospel goes, they have become absolutely neutralized and ineffective. Now seeing sin as normal and calling holy what the Bible calls sin. So friends, when you are on the lookout for the, the teaching um, that contains the language and the literature of the Chaldeans, don't forget to look in the pulpits. Which is why, friends, when you're in church, you should always have your Bible open in front of you and checking from the scriptures that what the preacher is saying is firstly in the Bible, and secondly, what they're saying is absolutely true. The language and the literature of the Chaldeans is everywhere in society and focused especially on the young. Which is why, friends, in every generation, in every generation, the people of God must give special attention to teaching the young. All over the country and all during the summer, scripture union camps will be committed to this very task teaching God's word and ways to thousands of youngsters. That's why here at the church uh, we have um, things set aside for children, not just to give our kids somewhere to go and something to do, but in order that the Bible would be taught faithfully to our children. Maybe you've heard someone say, or maybe you've said it yourself, oh, we don't want to put the young folks off. I wish we just had a wee bit less teaching from the Bible. Well, if that's you, friend, what you need to understand is this. Babylon is absolutely relentless in its teaching. Taking every opportunity to teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans to our children. And we must be also, we must also be relentless. Taking every opportunity to teach our children the ways and the word of God. That's why Moses writes as he does in Deuteronomy 6 and 7. You shall teach God's word and ways diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And you need to take this seriously if you're a parent, if you're thinking about becoming a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you have any sort of influence at all over a child. You need to take this seriously. And what you also need to remember is this. The work that Scripture Union does and the things that are done for children here at the church are only a supplemental work. It's not the church's job or Scripture Union's job to make sure that your wains are Christians. It's your job. It's your job. Your child's spiritual progress fundamentally depends on you and the work that you do at home and especially amongst you fathers. So I hope you're taking that seriously. Don't force your kids is what people say, isn't it? Or let them make up their own minds. Friends, don't let your children make up their own minds when it comes to the things of faith. They're not smart enough. I mean, they struggle to know what colour of shoes goes with what colour of top. No, we are to do as instructed by Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's indoctrination, you might say. Well, that may be so. But take a look at uh, Babylon's indoctrination program. Look at verse 6 and 7. Daniel and his friends, they have their names changed. Maybe some of you would like uh, your names changed. My full name is Terence Andrew Patrick Murphy McCaffrey McCutcheon. So there's no prizes for guessing what football team I support. <laughs> now you may laugh, but I love my name. I wouldn't change my name for anything. But look at the names here. Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, Azariah. These names all contain one of the Hebrew names for God. The names of God, El or Yah. But these were changed so that they included names of the Babylonian gods, the Babylonian gods Bel or Nebo. So what was done with their names 
was symbolic of what was hoped the training program would accomplish in their lives. God had been put out of their names as a symbol that Nebuchadnezzar intended to put God out of their lives. I'm sure you know that the little rhyme, sticks and stones may, may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, friends, I would change that. Sticks and stones may break my bones, and names will finish me off. That's what the language and the literature of the Chaldeans intends to do, both then and now, that as far as God goes in your life, to finish you off. Well, friends, how do you think you would have fared in this environment where the teaching and the name-calling were relentless, like the drip, drip, dripping of a tap, silent voices every day saying to you, you don't belong to the Lord, you belong to this pagan world. And friends, the great crisis is this, and the great question is this, who am I going to be, and who am I going to serve? And friends, this question is alive and well in the lives of our teenagers and all of our lives day after day. Am I the Lord's or am I the pagans? But Daniel and his friends, well, they could see that this is what was going on, which is why we have in verses 8 to 16, drawing the line, drawing the line. It seems that no one else noticed what was, was really at the root of Nebuchadnezzar's training program except these four young boys. And we need to remember that these went mature men, maybe like the eldership we have here um, at the church. They were mature spiritually, but they were only 14 years old. Maybe the age of someone who would attend the youth club here or um, Sunday school here. But despite their years, they saw the danger. They seen what was going on, verse 8. Daniel resolved or Daniel purposed in his heart. This was, this was principled action here taken by Daniel. It wasn't thought up in the moment. There had been fixed points established in Daniel's heart and in Daniel's mind about what he would say yes to and about what he would say no to, about what he believed and how he would behave. And there is a real lesson here for us, friends. We can't just make it up as we go along or um, make a decision when the fight is upon you, by then it's too late. I came across a quote from arguably the greatest boxer of all time, Muhammad Ali, um, and here's what Muhammad Ali said. The fight is won or lost, far away from the fight itself, far away from witnesses, behind the lines, in the gym, and out there on the road, long before I dance under those lights. The fight is won or lost far away from the fight itself. It's won or lost in the resolutions that we make or we don't make in our hearts. Well, what was the issue in which Daniel drew the line? Verse 8. And Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. It's on the issue of food and drink from the king's table. And this would seem to be a strange issue in which to take a stand. There seems to be no indication in the text at all that Daniel kicked up a fuss when he was enlisted in the training program or when he had his name changed. Well, why not? Why did he accept any of it? Pastor Alistair Begg is very helpful here. He says Daniel was willing to cooperate without compromising. Now, I am sure some of the exiles that were taken to Babylon would have been totally absorbed in the culture they would have settled down thinking and saying to themselves, oh well, when in Babylon do as the Babylonians do? Losing all their distinctiveness, maybe revealing that their love of the Lord was only a matter of mere external religion and not internally of the heart. Others may have withdrawn from the culture, deciding that they would have absolutely nothing to do with Babylon, so they would create a holy huddle. They wouldn't be absorbed by the culture, they would totally withdraw from it, but not Daniel. Daniel cooperated without compromising. He knew what to say yes to, and he knew what to say no to. And friends, it's the same for us. 
We are exiles in a foreign land. And we must cooperate without compromising. We must study our foreign land and its ways. We must understand it if we are to penetrate it and affect it for God just like Daniel. Well, why would Daniel say no? No to food and wine from the king's table. Was Daniel advocating vegetarianism or being teetotal? Well, no, he wasn't. Some of the commentators take the view that the food and wine would have been offered to idols before it was served, and so that's why Daniel refused it, which is true. But others, most notably Bob Fyle, said that this would have been also true of the vegetables. So Daniel could have ate. But not eating was a sign and a symbol that he was different. And he was reminding himself of this fact, that, that he was going to impact the culture for the Lord. Studying Babylonian science and culture and bearing a Babylonian name could be undertaken with loyalty to God, uncompromised. But eating, eating with all its implications of fellowship and solidarity, could not. And you see once again here the subtlety here. It's food from the king's table. Daniel, we've invested so much in you. And here now is food and drink from the king's table. But Daniel would not eat from the king of Babylon's table as a reminder to him that he did not belong to the king of Babylon. He belonged to the king of just Jerusalem and to the Lord alone. And friends, we need to know and we need to learn how to draw the line just like Daniel. There are some things that we must refuse, lines that we won't cross, and places we won't go. The decision made here by Daniel was, was fundamental to the rest of his life and to the rest of the story. There would be no sermon in chapter 6 next week if Daniel hadn't drawn the line in chapter 1. His early days in Babylon determined whose he was and what he was. He nailed his colours to the mast. And this is a real lesson for all of us. But I especially want to address those of a younger generation. God may have great things for you to do when you're 30, 40, or maybe even 50. But God needs you now. God needs you now to start drawing the line. God needs you now to start purposing in your heart that you will not defile yourself with food from the king's table. God needs you now to nail your colours to the mast, saying to the world, I am Christ's and he is mine. And especially those who are experiencing things for the first time, maybe like going off to university or going into the workplace, you must nail your colours to the mast in the earliest of days. Always take the first opportunity to show yourself as a, a decided, committed Christian. That may not be an easy thing to do, friends. But the fact of the matter is this. No easier opportunity will present itself. The second opportunity is always much more difficult to take if the first one has been refused. And friends, I want us just to note that, that Daniel drew the line using politeness and tact. Verse 11. He was very careful, but he was very firm. He wasn't arrogant. No need to offend people unnecessarily as they often don't understand why we are doing what we are doing. And there was danger also involved for Daniel. He risked his life. He risked it being reported that he didn't want to eat the king's food. And this would have offended the king. But verse 9, even here God's sovereign hand of protection was upon him as the chief of eunuchs showed favour and compassion to him. Friends, is there anything in which you are prepared to draw the line in order that you may stand for Christ and his kingdom? I was reminded just the other week of the story of what I believe to be a modern-day Daniel. Eric Liddell, who you might remember, who won the gold medal for the 400 metres in the 1924 Paris Olympic Games. Uh, you maybe remember that the film Chariots of Fire dramatised um, his story. And you also may remember that um, Eric was supposed to be running in the, the 100 metre sprint. But as he was a Christian and those heats were to be run on a Sunday, he, he refused to run. And you may remember the scene in the film where he was being pressurised to run, even by the future king. And even under that pressure, Eric Liddell refused. He drew the line. 
He was polite. He was firm. Even though they couldn't understand his convictions, nonetheless, he purposed in his heart that he would draw the line and he would not defile himself. Are you willing to draw the line? Well, if you are, friends, then you will find that just through your stand, just like Daniel and Eric Liddell, God will advance his kingdom. Verse 17 to 21. God will advance his kingdom. That was God's purposes through the stand of Daniel and his friends. It was all for God's glory. All part of God's unfolding plan. Remember verse 2? Even the exile was under the control of God. And here in verse 17, God's sovereign hand is still at work. God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams, which would come in very handy in chapter 2. God will use Daniel to advance his kingdom as God's plans and purposes unfold in Babylon. Daniel plays a vital role in Babylon for about seven decades. Verse 21. He accomplishes great things for the kingdom due to the resolve that he had to make a stand and to draw the line. He stood for the city of God amidst the city of man. And friends, we need to know that every stand is for a purpose. No matter how big or no matter how small the stand might be, it is for a purpose to advance the kingdom of God for the glory of Jesus Christ. Friends, let that be an encouragement to you. In all the battles that you face, they are a battle for the glory of Jesus Christ and for the advance of the kingdom of God. The battles will last right to the very end, but we must continue to stand to draw the line. Standing may come at an exceptional cost. In fact, it may cost us everything. It will be deeply personal and maybe deeply painful. But we must continue to stand as the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the only hope for our town, our country, and indeed our world. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose for him. And dare to make it known. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to faithfully live in a foreign land. May God grant us his grace and strength to do this. Let us pray together. Father, we give you great thanks that you are indeed sovereign, sovereign over all the affairs of men. And Father, we would pray that your sovereignty would be a great comfort to us as we head back into the world of man. We pray, dear Father, that you would indeed help us to be sure and to understand all the issues that are at hand. And we pray, Father, that just like Daniel and his friends, that you would help us to draw the line and to stand for, for you, dear Father, among the city of men. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.